All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the STOA. That intro uh, was hippie radio from Dark Roads. Um, and today we have Stephen Jenkinson uh, with us returning to the STOA. Um, Stephen is the founder of Orphan Wisdom uh, and author of Die Wise, uh, a manifesto for sanity and the soul. Uh, and he's released a new book called The Generations, A Generation's Worth, Spirit Work While the Crisis Reigns. Um, and Stephen is going to be our philosopher in residence at the STOA for the month of August. And this is going to be a three-part uh, series. And the series is serving as sort of a book launch uh, party. Um, so I highly recommend everyone uh, here today and people watching on YouTube to purchase the book so we can um, read along uh, while we have Stephen uh, with us in this philosophical residency. Um, and we'll also have a fourth session without Stephen where we can discuss the book uh, together um, with the entire STOA. So hopefully uh, most of us have uh, read the book by then. Um, so today, how... Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to watch a trailer for the book right now um so everyone has a kind of a sense of what it is and then uh i'll take steven in and he can kind of share his thoughts and i'll warm him up with a few questions and uh if you have any questions anytime maybe put your hand icon uh, raise your hand icon or just put a question in the chat or just something that you want to share and then we'll riff on that uh we're here for about 60 uh 90 minutes uh, so that being said i will share my screen right now and we can watch the trailer. If I'm going to be dead, you know, relatively soon, would I like my name attached to one beautiful thing? I would. Shall I wait for the trade to decide that it's my turn? I shan't. So I didn't. So I decided I'm going to make something beautiful with help. And I got help to do it. Yeah, we made, we made, uh, to use the Spanish term grabado prints, from which we get the word to engrave, same root there. And um, I, I worked with him in the design. I didn't do the actual work. And then when it came time to printing, we went to a little printing press in Oaxaca off the main drag. And... I knew I didn't want to illustrate anything. I didn't want help illustrating anything. I can do that, you know, with the, with the words. I wanted an incarnation of something that I couldn't manage. I wanted something of the, the debris of my ordinary life, as it appeared in the book, to turn into the way by which I might uh, befriend the plague and very, very briefly prevail. It's my hat, you know, it's my guitar, it's my boots, it's my jacket. All the stuff that I lean on to go to the well and get up on the, on the stage. And I just didn't want to leave them behind. We, we coveted these linoleum tiles like they were the tablets, you know, from, from on high. And uh, we both knew what we had to do the second we got back from the printing house. And we did. We made a fire in the back of the house we were staying at. And uh, all of the work that had gone into them went up in acrid smoke almost immediately, times four. But I have to confess that we made a kind of alternative print of the cover. Didn't use it. Made ten little artist proofs to see if it worked. And I kept that that tile so I still have that one and I have the 10 proofs as a as a sign that I'm not not as nearly as honest on these uh, matters of authenticity as I had imagined myself to be
All right. Um, so uh, we'll engage in a conversation with Stephen now. Um, perhaps uh, I'll tag Stephen in um, if he'd like to uh, share any thoughts on uh, uh, to open up this philosophical residency. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear them. Uh, and welcome back to the, the store, my friend. You're on, you're on mute. Uh, oh, we can't, we can't hear you, Stephen. One, two, three, how about now? Yep. How's that? Yeah, we gotcha. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was saying uh, I'm, I'm now overwhelmed by visions of myself, which is nobody's idea of a good time, I don't think. <laughs> so um, fortunately, I can't see myself on the screen now. I, I'd forgotten about that confession there at the end. This uh, idea that, um, you know, I parted with everything I was expected to part with and, and I hung on to a memento, a sign that we really did get our dirt under our fingernails in that project. And uh, I, I'm glad I did actually. I mean, it's never gonna see the light of day, but among the few things that I hold on to that are a sign or some kind of proof of what I've done, um, those will be uh, precious. You know, if you live your life as a, I was called by a French Canadian once a philosopher. No English person has ever referred to me that way, but but I appreciated it, you know? And it seems to me there's not a lot of mementos in the philosophy business. <laughs> not a lot of uh, souvenirs, if you will. But uh, but that's one. So. Um, so I'm glad it's there, and uh, I'm glad the uh, the book has, is illustrated for a change. And uh, let's see what you'd like to talk about now. So um, I ordered the book, and it hasn't arrived yet. But uh, I've been looking at the uh, advanced uh, copy that you sent. Um, and the thing that uh, caught my attention right away was the kind of the very first thing in the first chapter. Uh, so the first chapter is called Die Wise, um, while there's still such a thing as wisdom. Right. Um, perhaps that'd be a good place to start. Okay, so, so your question on the matter would be what? <laughs> um, what do you mean by that? Well, Die Wise, I think at this point, let's just say that the book's been out for, uh, seven years or five and uh, you know it's a case fairly well made i would say so i'm not sure that that part needs any further elaboration beyond what the book managed but the subtitle maybe so while there's still such a thing as wisdom what i'm referring to there uh, is this it seems to me that the 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 notion of wisdom itself is under prolonged and severe attack by degradation more than by outright uh, opposition. And the degradation of, uh, of wisdom, it seems to me, uh, is, is um, achieved by degrading the notion of tradition. So let me uh, begin this um, noodling this way. Can you inherit wisdom? I wondered this off and on, off and on, because as a perpetrator of a school, it's a fairly important consideration to return to over and over again. And the conclusion I've come to over and over again is no, you cannot inherit wisdom, which you know really is a gauntlet at the feet of, of any school perpetrator such as myself. So let me elaborate uh, on the conclusion that I arrived at, and I'll do so by talking about something wisdom isn't first, uh, and that would be uh, prejudice. So can you inherit prejudice? My answer would be, not only can you, this is the only way you can come by it. This is a, a bracing thought to think for a moment. We might consider uh, in our darker moments, our grimmer times, that prejudice is, a, is a, a naturally occurring event, if you will, a kind of inevitable weather 
at least where humans, whenever humans are present, a prejud- the weather of prejudice prevails, at least as often as not. Well, I'm not persuaded that's true, though. I think, I think it comes to this. We experience prejudice that way, meaning prejudice is so, so self-evident that it needs very little work, you see. And so I'm by saying this, you're going to hear a, a lot of noise going up and down the river because it's a uh, holiday week, I think. And uh, there it goes now. Speaking of prejudice, I have one against that kind of activity. But uh, the way that prejudice seems to function is its self-evidence bears it along. In other words, I've never heard of anyone, certainly no one ever came to my office or was in touch with me over this internet asking if they could talk to me about how to reinforce and restore and recover and uh, uh, resuscitate their prejudices. Never happened. Nothing of the kind ever took place. Why is that? Well, because you could say nobody in the right mind would, would think of, you know, saying that out loud. Or you could imagine it this way. Prejudice doesn't need restoration. Uh, a, you know, a daily dose of other people can restore your faith in your prejudices without much challenge. Now, I'm not crediting the, the prejudice when I'm saying this. I'm talking about it phenomenologically here now, rather than approvingly. So, <clears throat> so it's astounding then that prejudice needs no labor. And because of that, because it seems so self-evident when you're in its presence and in its clutches, it's, um, it, you come by it readily. You come by it easily. Uh, if it doesn't need any work, by definition, to my mind, it's globalizable. You can translate from it readily. You can infer from it about the near future, about who's a good guy and who's not a good guy and all these manners of things. And the automaticness of that globalizing tendency uh, is the root condition of the, the more generic globalization that seems to be oh, that's clearly going on now. I'm saying all of this as a counterpoint to the question about wisdom. That's why I'm taking a moment, because I'd like to suggest that the reason that wisdom is not inheritable is because of its uh, specificity, its locality, its, its topos, to use the Greek word. As I've come to understand wisdom and tried to practice it in fitful ways, uh, one of the things that's occurred to me over and over again is it is so site-specific, it is so time-relevant, it is so a child of its, the particulars of its time and place that it not only is it not translatable from other times and places, but it actually requires a tremendous amount of work to simply to linger among us and to endure. Uh, and that work is what's referred to in the subtitle uh, of the book, uh, Spirit Work While the Crisis reigns. The spirit work I'm referring to is the willingness to stand, let's say, counter to the, what I think is the prevailing psychic weather of the time, which is to do, to make low-grade and unspectacular war on everything that has preceded us, on tradition in a nutshell, on the notion of received wisdom. That notion I agree with. There's no such thing as received wisdom by virtue of its content. That would be true. In other words, wisdom is so specific that it needs its, its workers in place, in situ, in vivo, to occur at all. So a, a given generation cannot inherit the content of the wisdom of its predecessors. What it can inherit and must inherit is the example of its predecessors, the willingness of its predecessors to enter into a, a proper arm wrestling match with the troubles and the torments and the travails of its time. So in other words, uh, wisdom as I've come to understand it is a child of its time, not a master of its time, a quiet, subtle, uncertain servant of its time, but absolutely faithful 
as a witness to its time. Prejudice, by definition, uh, is, a, is neurotic, I would say, meaning to use the classic sort of psychiatric sense of neurosis, that uh, an, an example, of the onset of prejudice is the consequence of being overwhelmed by what preceded you. Yeah, that the present has no opportunity to appear because it's overwhelmed by the misapprehensions of the past. That is, it's overwhelmed by our misapprehending the past. So the final thing I'd say about it is, if you could imagine that there's such a thing as spirit work that accrues to a given generation, which I think is what makes a generation a generation, the spirit work that, that um, makes its claim upon a given generation. If there's such a thing, then um, by definition, the subsequent generation is, is standing in a position of one of two things. It either inherits the example of its predecessor having labored over its wisdom, or it inherits the undone spirit project of its predecessor. And when it does so, then the, the current generation has no opportunity to work, to labor over the particulars of its time, because its time is overwhelmed by the undone spirit project of its predecessor. This is, this is beyond grim when, when those things happen. And people have said to me at the conclusion of this little tirade, man, what would it look like if a generation in, is obliged to inherit the undone spirit work of its predecessor? My answer would be, what do you mean, what would it look like? That is specifically the time that we're in, it seems to me. So the plea I was making in the subtitle of the, the chapter is the notion that tradition serves us well when it becomes an exemplar and a practitioner, not when it becomes a dictator in terms of content. Only by the practice of its example. Um, well, I'll leave, I'll leave it there. We could go further, but that's a beginning. Um, Rhea, uh, would you like to um, jump in um, and share your thoughts? So I was just, uh, hello, Stephen uh, and everyone. <laughs> um, I was wondering, I'm a psychologist and look through that lens uh, partly. Um, because prejudice for me is also part of how one comes to belong to a family or a group or is part of that dynamic. And also wonder if maybe the, the current form of wisdom has also to do with what I'm very much interested in is that collective intelligence or collective wisdom, um, which can be fully accessed when we are really present together in a dialogue or in a soca practice or whatever you call it. Um, so I was wondering about that, how you look at that individual slash collective part of, of wisdom and prejudice and all that. That was my wondering. Okay. Well, um, I'm not persuaded that there's such a thing as individual wisdom. <laughs> In other words, I would probably be, be tended to befriend the idea that wisdom by its own fingerprints is collectively achieved, not unanimous, I should say, not in, not in even in a high functioning culture, which uh, the one that produced me is not such a culture. But um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that prejudice is a condition of belonging to take the first thing that you observed. And the thing I'd like to focus on for a second is the word belonging, or the verb to belong. Now, this is actually a, an Anglo Saxon word. So it's it behooves us maybe to wonder over the etymology for a moment, rather than automatically uh, genuflect in the direction of belonging, not that you're doing so, but it's not difficult to do. It's a kind of high watermark of human 
uh, experience. Well, let, let's see what the etymology tells us. So we have two parts to the word. We'll, we'll leave the root for a moment and focus on the beginning. Uh, this is an Anglo-Saxon pre uh, uh, prefix. And uh, in its origin, it was never, it never appeared uh, as a word. It was only ever a prefix. So it never functioned in this, at the level of the atomic uh, I the individualized, severely truncated I, as it's come to be used subsequently in philosophical circles and elsewhere. The word functioned as an intensifier, sem semantically, of what followed it in terms of the word formation. So you could say um, that the, the function of BE is to um, draw down a lot of attention upon what follows it. So it is in, in, it's in a sense empty of content, but, uh, but considerable in its consequence. And then we have the verb to long, which chances are nobody tuning into this call has used the word uh, as, a, as, a, as a verb to describe anything that they've done any time in recent memory. That's fascinating, eh? So, but we know that the verb to long has a kind of, even in the mouth, it has a kind of um, consequence that's not um, unpleasant. There's something compelling about the sound of it. So, so what does it mean to long? And this is a bit, um, perhaps consensus, uh, but I'll wonder on behalf of the collective here for a moment and say, um, what longing is not is desire. How do, and, and I'm going to talk about it in terms of its function rather than it, any kind of essence to it. It seems to me that the, the function of desire principally is to persuade you of the legitimacy of the pursuit of the object of desire. That's what it's very good at, prompting you in the direction of the object of your desire. And then it has a wonderful cover story, desire does. And it goes like this, once you achieve the object of your desire, you shall desire no longer, you shall dwell in the, in the land of, of uh, satisfaction, <laughs> or wholeness, or things of that kind. And the amazing thing, which could seem slightly demonic, perhaps, inflected in a certain direction, the amazing thing about desire is it's resurrection possibilities. In fact, it's, it's virtually a given of desire that it rises from the grave of satisfaction over and over and over again. Which is to say, I called it a cover story. It seems to me that the real thrust of desire is to perpetuate itself uh, by pretending or, yeah, pretending to satisfy itself. And it will come around and will come, and not just in matters of cuisine or hunger, but this is a, a psychic and a spiritual observation, it seems to me as well, and probably a political one. So it's, it is to say that the notion of, of uh, desire is that it, it certainly wages war on memory, which it, by which I mean that uh, desire is, is obviating memory more often than not. And how is this different then from, the, from longing? Uh, to my understanding, the function of longing, it has no cover story, basically, because it's not trying to stop. It's not pretending to stop. It's not pretending that there's an object that one, once one comes close to it, then the longing will cease. And the best example I can give you of this, it's, in, it's ineffable, and it's particular to me, the example is. But uh, consider this. So I worked in the death trade, as some of you may know, for a considerable time. Not a, not well, it wasn't in years. When I say considerable, I mean the breadth and the girth of the event was considerable. Uh, I did it as long as was humanly advisable. And while I was there, uh, one of the um, uh, fringe benefits, if you will, of working in the death trade and and being there when fellow human beings die during the course of their dying 
and at the moment of their death is that you are more or less obliged to consider the distinct possibility that such an event is waiting for you too. I'm saying that ironically, obviously. And then the next layer of insight on the matter is that uh, you're obliged to consider the realities, the tactical realities of your demise. And then finally, if you're lucky, with enormous amount of labor of the counterintuitive kind, you see your death. It's not really something to go looking for because I think it evades that kind of tyrannical insistence on making it answer to you. But you can see its conditions. You can, you can be an inadvertent witness to the likelihoods that will accompany your death. When that happens, uh, as I saw it amongst the staff I worked with and uh, as well as uh, the families of the people who are dying and the dying people themselves, you're faced with a kind of morbid psychic choice, which may come down to this. You decide that you're going to die as a way of life betraying you. And you can come to it as a belligerent and as a fundamental fundamentalist in the complaining and entitlement trade. You could. You, it could oblige you to cling to life all the harder as a result of doing so. The alternative to that is that you could recognize yourself in the presence of the fact of your death as a person who is finally alive. That's the way it came to me, the second one. That, in other words, that there was something about being alive that eluded me prior to having glimpsed the realities of my death. And uh, there's not much to brag about in that regard because you can come deeply into your life not having really uh, uh, witnessed this and as, as a result, perhaps not fully inhabiting the days that are allotted to you. What do I mean, perhaps, or sort of? Of course, this is one of the consequences. So lo and behold, I'm in the presence of my death and my life, my livingness, if you will, becomes what I've come to call habit forming. That's, that's the way it comes to me. It's uh, not habituated rather, but my my desire to live was accentuated as a consequence of my time in the death trade. The irony of the declaration is I'm, I'm doing so while alive. In other words, being alive in and of itself doesn't seem to have been quite enough to get me there. But glimpsing my death obliges me to belong to life. And that's one of the great gifts that uh, that came to me that I had no idea was there. I had no idea I was in need of it, frankly. So I say all of this to say it's not clear to me, actually, that prejudice is a condition of belonging. It's certainly a condition of active participation in a, in a collective with a shared understanding of things. Yes, of course. But belonging seems, I mean, I reserve in my understanding of the word, in my practice of it, I reserve the meaning for the etymology rather than anything that prevails today. So belonging is the intensification of longing. It's an extraordinary uh, linguistic event that Anglo-Saxons are normally uh, exempted from being able to accomplish. But it's certainly in this case they did because they were saying that it is possible in the presence of your longing to long even so or evermore. That's what the act of belonging does. It doesn't extinguish your longing for belonging. It accentuates and practices it instead. Any uh, follow-up, uh, Rhea? I can just see how the because I'm looking through the lens of, of, of 
development and child, child psychology where we get these prejudices with us they already come from being in the family and in the culture group we grew up in but this kind of belonging is way bigger than just family or whatever it's it's it it's actually related with life itself so yeah that's good good to think about to let it sink in thank you thank you jessica you had your hand up Thank you. Um, okay, is it okay if I take a little bit of runway to get into the question? I um, Okay, so there's a woman working in the US named Martha Jo Atkins, who's, uh, she is someone who's worked in the death trade, as you say, and someone who, like you, has the ability to be present with death um, in a very deep way. And her father named Noble Atkins, uh, when it came to his time of dying and knowing his daughter's gifts, he agreed to allow her to video the last six weeks of his life around the clock. And then five years, it probably took five years later, she was able to sort of edit and excerpt parts of those to help educate and train people. And so I took a class in which we sat, I, I, I would say that through video, I was able to, in some ways, vigil at the bedside of someone who I didn't know beforehand in community with someone who was able to facilitate um, coming back to present when members of the group became overwhelmed. And through that experience, it was so, like you talked about the degradation of wisdom and it felt like a restoration. It felt like was that um, in the same way that you know how stem cells are biologically interesting to researchers because they have a, a pluripotentiality they can become anything it felt to me that presence with death deep presence with death has that same kind of pluripotential um of transformation and healing and um yeah and so it, it for, for me i was able to heal my, my own father's death and I was able to I think to prepare myself and and just in some ways stretch into maybe some form of elderhood that wouldn't have been available if I hadn't had that experience and so anyway I'm just wondering um is this when you talk about considering your own death um do you think all like do you think that all death all forms of death are available to us that they could transform us in this way if we would allow it Um, I'm not sure what you mean by all forms of death. I don't think you're thinking about causes there. Could you say a little more about what you mean by forms of death? I, I What I mean is that if we would allow it, death is around us all the time when the leaves fall from the trees or like, so, so that I think we only consider it normally when it's, you know, a family member, someone that we love is the only time we would allow ourselves to even peek, you know, at, yeah. as a, yeah, that's what I mean. Okay. Okay. I think what one of the things your question is down to is something I've often asked an unsuspecting audience. And it's, it's very simple and it goes like this. All in favor of the proposition that everybody knows they're going to die. Please raise your hand. I, I've done this usually unannounced, which helps. And at first, people are quite embarrassed. Don't forget, they self-select by virtue of coming to something I do. So they're already, you would imagine, or they would imagine, well-versed in terms of wonder, at least, on the subject at hand. And then I ask this rather naked and unadorned and unsophisticated question. Does, do you really think that everybody knows they're going to die? And so the, the responses are actually reluctant at first, but I think the dynamic has to do with what I just described. Eventually, all the hands go up with the possible exception of um, uh, sort of new age oriented people who have an idea that there's no such thing as death and it's just transition or I can't think of the other words right now, a kind of soft pedaled sort of minor keyed easy death or death light is what they're imagining, I guess. 
But for the rest of us, apparently the answer is yes. So up all the hands go. And then they all look at me like, so where do we go with this? And this is where I went with it. Now I would say, uh, of course, by telling you the story now, I'm inviting you to reconsider the allegation that everybody knows they're going to die. That's the bottom of this wonder. But uh, many of us uh, are old enough to remember, at least have heard the story of something that was called the oil crisis in the 1970s. And, um, you know, there's fist fight at the pumps and all kinds of lineups and all the whole thing. Yes. And this took place in the context of the widespread knowledge that that which everyone knew that there was enough oil forever and ever amen for everything that we wanted that's where it took place and the knowledge was palpable at that time how could you tell that everybody knew there was enough oil forever answer is by how they carried themselves and how they how they chose to spend their money and what they did with their so-called leisure time and you know a few other um, high-end indicators this wasn't a matter of opinion this was a matter of knowledge you see now the caveat that we have to introduce here is that it was never true it was never true that there was enough oil for an ever and ever all men certainly not for our way of life but that didn't prevent people from knowing it see and that's a useful distinction to make with what i'm about to say i think because if you take oil out of the, the description I just give you and, and put death in its place, I believe I can make a very similar case. <clears throat> that is to say, it is very much a challenging proposition to investigate, this sounds a little ungenerous, but to investigate the lives of your immediate peers and inquire deeply as to whether or not there is palpable, demonstrable proof by virtue of how these people are living their lives and the decisions that they make, that they're doing so in the presence of the active and available knowledge of the imminence of their own death. I would go out on a limb and say to you, the chances are very good. I would have had no career whatsoever there never would have been a film called uh, Grief Walker. There never would have been a book uh, coming from me called uh, Die Wise because it would be unnecessary. It would be redundant and embarrassingly pedestrian to write a book about dying in a culture where everybody knew they were going to die. And so the claim I'm making is sort of in a roundabout way is that I think it's demonstrably true that most people do not know that they're going to die. They, they may suspect it, they may fear it, they, and a lot of other examples, but the knowledge is simply not demonstrable, not available. And so with that in mind, coming around to the scenario you've described, I think the, the precursor to the healing notions that you've brought and the transformative notions that you allude to is the willingness to know it that willingness so far is in relatively short supply now i've been asked many times in interviews in the last year and a half uh well not asked the allegation has been made baldly that by virtue of the presence of the plague and the body count on the nightly news and a few other uh, indicators that um, we are closer to our death and closer to death now than we would have been in the in the glory days of 2019. And then it falls to me to to challenge that assumption. And I'm doing so now by saying to you, closeness to death is not a question of proximity. In other words, there is death available to us, plague or no plague, ongoingly. In a genteel culture, you kind of have to seek it out. You have to seek out access to the deaths of people who, who precede your own. Uh, generally speaking, because of the societal norms that have congealed around dying, uh, which include making it private, personal, uh, uh, centripetal, uh, family and close friends only, all of that, a personal possession, all of those things mitigate 
against a sort of a culturally available wisdom, death wisdom. They mitigate against it. So um, there's, I don't think the plague has done anything to that. I think it's accentuated it. Uh, you know, a proximity to death is a question of willingness. It is not a question of exposure. If it were, then the, the simple news of the death of our neighbors would have the consequence that you've imagined in your question. But I've never seen it occur that way. What I've seen happen instead is the news of the death of one's neighbor prompts a there but for the grace of God go I kind of response or a kind of um, rather habituated murmuring about uh, uh, you know how too bad it might have been or how welcome it finally was if there was a lot of travail ahead of time. But the compound fracture of one's absolute assurance that one wakes up every day expecting to live doesn't for the most part occur. Now this is, this, this stymies actually the notion that dying in and of itself has a kind of transformative power. The news of dying, the exposure to dying. I know I'm going on here with, with the response to what you said, but you've opened up a lot. So forgive me, give me another two or three minutes and then I'm happy to turn the floor over again. So, I was just invited by some National Nurses Association to talk with them for an hour at some conference they're going to have in the fall. And in there, the, well, they asked me to write up the abstract and so on. And I just don't do that kind of thing anymore. So I said, you write up the abstract. That will be your way of telling me what you want to hear about. And then I'll happy to you know, deliver. In there, uh, the person who was in touch with me wrote down uh, death and dying. Well, she didn't invent the phrase. It's been around quite a long time, about 50 or so years, I think, now in the West. And first of all, from a temporal point of view, there's some confusion when you call it death and dying. It's, it, it works better when it rolls off the tongue, but it doesn't work very well in understanding, you know, where to put the emphasis on um, what to expect first. Dying comes first and death comes last, but... You know the book title I'm referring to here by alluding to this. So I'm suggesting to you this. That book has had, I mean, its penetration into the psychic marketplace of the West is unconscionable. It's so thorough and so profound. And it, it amazes me at many levels. And then it didn't amaze me so much when I really tried to investigate the phenomenon, which is the uptake of that book and its famous five stages. In a, to say this very quickly, the five stages that were developed in the book, I'm not talking about what was done with them, but the book proper, uh, can be read, I think, more accurately, not as a description of the inevitable five stages of dying. I humbly suggest to you that there's no such thing as stages of dying. So there's something about the popularity of the book and it's misrepresentation of the realities of death that are coincidental. This is what I think it is. I think the book can be better understood as a, a sequence of stages in coping with trauma. It's principally a trauma handbook, I think. And the assumption that underlies its application to death work comes to this. Dying is inherently traumatizing. The exposure to death is inherently traumatizing. It needs coping strategies to not lose your mind in the presence of the oncomingness of you, either your own death or someone close to you. That's really what those stages are for, is to, to tread water pretending to swim, if you will. And this is why you're obliged to get to acceptance at the end because it's it's a synonym functionally speaking for defeat you see so if this were true about dying that's inherently traumatizing you would be you would be hearing right now from perhaps the most traumatized person you're ever likely to meet because i was certainly exposed to it over and over and over again now i'll leave it for you to decide whether or not i i resemble that description i uh, i don't think i do 
I'm telling you then the exposure to the deaths to the deaths of fellow human beings has a number of possibilities that you've alluded to. You have no obligation to be traumatized by the understanding, the pseudo understanding that dying is inherently traumatizing. It's not inherently traumatizing in a culture that is not addicted to competence, mastery and self direction. But if you happen to be a denizen of a culture that does have those addictions, be not surprised that dying by definition becomes traumatizing because it, it it's a, a visitation yet again of the question of who's in charge, who's calling the shots, who's making the decision, who's the boss, as if that's what dying's about. So it's been taken up in the culture um, because the culture remains addicted to competence and mastery and self-determination, even in the presence of something that would hand those addictions back to us and ask us if we're still interested in continuing with them, which is, I think, what dying does. Anyway, let me stop there and, and invite some response if you'd, if you'd like. Yeah, well, thank you for all of that. And I, and yeah, there was so much to your answer, but, but one of the points that really me was the difference with the, the trauma and then with the class that I took uh, one of the practices that we did was um, matching the breathing of Noble as he was moving further along and so from deeper breathing to higher in the chest to, and so the, I think that experience of breathing together as a class helped to keep us out of our trauma and I think that as we were starting to feel you know, like what it feels like to breathe way up here as you're coming close to the end, put us in touch maybe with some of our own death, fear of death, those sorts of things. And so that speaks to the willingness that you were talking about, um, willingness to know that it's, it's not proximity, it's willingness to know. And so I think that illuminated a lot. So thank you very much for that. Oh, you bet. I would actually go a little step further and say, perhaps the obligation is the willingness to be overwhelmed not traumatized, simply overwhelmed. Um, dying is, uh, I think the best characterization that I've ever managed is that dying is by definition a deity. It's a working God, I've come to call it. And, and as such, you know, it's, it behooves us to learn the etiquette of such a um, unprecedented encounter. It's something like going to the radical wilderness and finding yourself totally unable to be there, even though your feet would declare that you're there, but the rest of you has no capacity. It's something that you have to learn over time to be somewhere for real and, you know, to, to occupy the august position of attending to the death of a fellow human being requires all of the demolition of self mastery that you can manage. It's very counterintuitive because the seduction is to feel is to operate um, authoritatively, if you will, even at the level of being a human being, you know, and you think about all of the extraordinary uh, um, turns of phrase that show up at deathbeds like better place and um uh i just i just stop i don't want to re reawaken them all but but none of them describe the realities of dying all of them describe certain preferences that we have certain inflections that we would like to introduce to the to the raw reality of dying but dying doesn't need any inflection really its meaning is quite available you see, and uh, what it's a it's a revelator God dying is, which is to say that you will see yourself in rather naked action in the presence of the death of another or your own. And it's questionable whether or not people are bargaining for that when they when they draw nigh to dying if they do. And it's questionable about the willingness to to translate that into what your life should subsequently look like now that it's been radiated by the proper and just givenness 
of its demise and its cessation. Thank you, Jessica. Um, Evan, you had a question to share. Yeah, so um, my question is surrounding the topic of wisdom and the decay thereof in our society. And um, I think an interesting way into this might be um, the thing you were just speaking on to about the being in a wilderness and in some sense not recognizing that one is there fully. Um, so the way I want to frame my question has to do with the relationship to wisdom that seems to have been prevalent in some older um, ancestors of our culture. I'm thinking here specifically of the Greeks. And so the Greeks had uh, a very rich and nuanced concept of wisdom involving concepts, not just like Sophia, but like phronesis or metis, right? So this sense of a practical wisdom that's very alive to the present moment. And this seems to me, at least, to be a major part of the sort of um, essence of wisdom, which is uh, invisible or neglected in our culture. And so I wonder if you see, um, like, like, I guess, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how that's become the case. My, my speculation along these lines is something that that metis or phronesis is in part cultivated by having a real direct hands-on engagement. So through the practice of art and craftsmanship and music and so on, that, that we do a lot less of that, but you know, I don't really know. So I'm just curious to hear you riff on any, anything that comes up surrounding those topics. Okay, thank you. Well, I don't really know either. So let's, um, let's start there and not wage war on our uncertainties, but to give them a proper place at the table. Um, What happened? Let me work backwards from that thing. You introduced that very briefly in, in, in what you were saying. Did something happen? Did something stop happening? Uh, I would like to offer the following possibility. I can't locate this in the specifics of place and time, but I think it's something like um, the Iron Age, in that the Iron Age didn't happen one place and then you know, and then the entire world was suddenly in the Iron Age. The Iron Age occurred uh, over the course of centuries and centuries in different places. And maybe, maybe what I'm about to describe is similar. You could say that, um, I'm going to use the word um, community for a moment as opposed to civilization, not just for the sake of scale distinction, but uh, distinction in, in kind. That the, the principal uh, logo for village mindedness is the hand. Here's what, I, here's what I mean by this. So if you think, for example, of the word tool, um, these are very handy to have. Uh, you know, you alluded to uh, making music and and uh, and craft, if you will. So, tool is very handy for the suggestion that you've made here. If you think of tool, they're they're very welcome when you need them. I'm thinking in a contemporary sense now. Otherwise, they get in the way. <laughs> you need a highly organized scheme to make them available to you when the moment of need is upon you. Rarely, if ever, have I ever heard a person described as a tool in any way that's not um, derisive. It's a very interesting term, then. The tool is very welcome in certain circumstances, but not as a personal uh, adjective. It's a, that being the case, then, I'd like to imagine that it is, it is the quintessential function of a tool to to represent palpably the functions of the hand. So, for example, a screwdriver could be understood as what you mistakenly do with your fingernails sometimes when you can't find a screwdriver. Not a good idea. A hammer could be understood with the soft part of your hand trying to force something to go and all that sort of thing. Um, what the hand, what the tool does is extends the range 
of the hand. It, it, it's manifest in the hand's functions, but it extends the range of the function, if you will. And it's, it's amazingly powerful presence. You, everybody remembers that image in the film 2001 A Space Odyssey when the chimpanzee or whatever it was, I can't remember now, holds up a, a jawbone, I think, if I remember. And you get the idea that this is a tool verging upon a weapon. And that's a transition I'd like to make now. So, so to say it again, what the tool does is extends the range of the hand with the fundamental uh, limitations of the hand intact in the tool. That's a very important criteria. The fundamental limitations of the hand are manifest in the tool, even though it extends the range of the hand. And that constitutes, to my mind, a village-minded approach to the world, tactically, in terms of praxis, uh, many other things that you've alluded to. The alternative I'd like to offer here, and it's a tragic one, is the one of civilization, wherein the, the principal attribute of civilization is not tool, but machine. And the difference between the two, it seems to me, is not a matter of degree, but fundamentally of kind. Because what a machine does is extends the range of the human will instead. It has absolutely no relationship to the human hand or its manifest and necessary limitations. It extends the will instead. And we are deeply and sadly and tragically and i would say demonically in the grip of the extent the machine enabled extension of our will as we speak right now so the reason i mention that is is to uh maybe expand the the terms of reference that you were using and and dream about the possibility that a hand made life is one of the more redemptive of things available to human beings. The willingness to undertake the self-administered limitations of a handmade life might be the underpinning of our capacity to live sustainably and sustainingly at the same time. I really love that. Um... Thank you for that. So okay. I, 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 that's 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 wonderfully accurate. I think, and and I guess what's coming up for me here is, I feel like there is what I sometimes think of as a missing middle of 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 wisdom or of being human, um, where there's a lot of attention surrounding the cultivation of practices like meditation or prayer or things like that. And then there's a lot of attention surrounding the cultivation of the sort of more intellectual side of, of being human, like philosophy per se, at least in the modern sense, um, you know, academia, uh, that sort of thing. And, and I, I, I've had this sense growing for years now that there is this missing middle, which consists of, and you just gave me the perfect words for it, the handmade life. Um, and, and having this sense of the translation of the inner into the world of the outer through the hands. And, and so, yeah, I guess, I guess I don't really have a follow-up question, but I just really thank you for that framing. That's, that's quite useful and, um, and, and really resonates with what I've been uh, thinking and feeling lately. So again, thank you. And if you have any other comments on that, I'd love to hear them. Surely. Well, you know, I do. <laughs> and thank you for the kind words there. Um, so we have this, we have this gesture. I can't, I'm not, I'm not any good at it, but uh, I think it appears routinely in icons, um, Christian and otherwise, Eastern and Western. Why is the thumb always involved? Because that hensile possibility is the grasping possibility. It's no accident that we use the same verb to describe the seizure of an item in the hand with the, the attempt to understand. The verb to seize or to grasp is translatable to both of those circumstances. It's not, it's not surprising 
that the it's the uh, the icon is showing us this. That's the first thing I wanted to respond to. Here's the second one. How did I come up with that? <laughs> uh, and the answer is, well, I was on the receiving end of some psychic corrective surgery uh, when I was about 30 years old. And so I'll just tell you briefly a, a true story that really happened. So I was in the, in the throes of making a living as a, as a stone carver, which is a ludicrous uh, proposition in North America, where there is no tradition for stone carving. It's precast concrete, baby. Nobody needs a stone carver, and not in this continent anyway. So, so I was trying to, I mean, I said I was making a living. That's a joke. I was, I was uh, trying to practice it as best I could, and then having to subsidize the, the habit by uh, income elsewhere. Somewhere in there, it, it occurred to me that being self-taught as a stone carver had its limits, as with everything else. And so I thought about trying to find a, an older person who'd done this for a while. And uh, through a part of the story that's not important to tell, I found somebody and he was in his 80s by this time. And uh, so I phoned him up, I got his phone number. And um, I said to him, and I, I blush to think about it now, but I said, after introducing myself briefly, I said, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a stone carver too. Two, I said, so I do the same work as you, you know, I thought maybe I'd just come over and, and you know, we could talk and uh, <laughs> anyway, I won't replay the rest of it. So he said, uh, oh, you do? And I said, yeah, bear in mind, he'd done this work for 70 years, 70. I'd probably done it for perhaps seven months. But, uh, you know, overstatement is, uh, is one of the curses of a neophyte, no? So, so I said, yeah, thinking that he was affirming my understanding of myself. And he said, um, tell me something. He said, do you work on it every day? Now I knew immediately what the right answer was. And I knew it was different from what the, the uh, factual answer was. The factual answer was no, I didn't do it every day. The right answer was yes. But I told the truth and I said, well, I, I think about it every day. I said, do you? He said, well, I'll tell you what, you call me back when you do it every day. And then he hung up the phone. And I sat there and thought to myself, what anybody would think in a moment like that in my stage of life. I thought, asshole. That was the first thought I had. He totally failed to, to collude with my, you understand. So, um, so the big dilemma is then, how long do I have to do it before I do it every day to qualify for the audience with this old man? And this is a matter of, you just have to choose. So I think I might have worked for three weeks steadily every day. And then I decided three weeks had to be enough. So I called him back. And uh, I said, this is and he stopped me He said, I know who it is. I said, Okay, well, look, it's only been three weeks. I know that. But I've worked every day. And Three, three weeks or three months more isn't going to be truer every day than this one is. So I just thought I'd give it a shot. And is there any possibility I could come to see you? He thought about it for a second. And this is what he said. This was the, the surgery. He said, okay. He said, uh, you can come over. I'll tell you where I am. Now he said, uh, the, we have to strike a deal though. And my end of the deal is this, I will tell you everything I know, he said, everything. Now he said, the likelihood is you're going to be disappointed because it's not going to take as long as you're counting on for me to tell you everything I know. You hear how brilliant this guy is? That's what he said though. Um, and, uh, but I will tell you everything I know. And the, the other half of the deal, your half of the deal is, that you keep none of what I tell you to yourself. And then he stopped and he said this, because if you do and I die, which is going to happen soon enough, I will find you and I will haunt your ass to kingdom come. Quote, that's what he said. It was a very proper Englishman until that moment. And uh, it was an amazing encounter at so many levels. Did I eventually see? Yes, I met him once or twice. It wasn't particularly warm uh, as an encounter, but he never promised that. 
what he did show me was the avails of a handmade life that were around him. And I should say as a PS to that, first of all, uh, the reason I'm doing this call now is because I'm trying to make sure he does not haunt my Aztec kingdom come now or in the foreseeable future, number one. And number two, he let this slip when I was there. He said, um, yeah, he said, I got almost everything I wanted in this life. Bear in mind, this is an old, frail bird of a man telling me this story. He said, um, you know, I, I married. It was good for a while. He said, and then it wasn't. He said, but my wife never turned the kids against me. For that, I'm grateful, he said. But he stopped and he said, but I, I don't think I ever really asked for love. And I don't think I ever got it. And that I would submit to you is every bit a handmade life attribute too. Not the not asking for love, but the understanding that the the outcome of one's romantic, you know, uh, investigations come down to your willingness to petition on behalf of that thing. And uh, I mean, it was a beautiful encounter. And so, so there it is, more than you bargained for. I, I, actual story. Thank you, uh, Evan. Um, do you have time for one more question, uh, Stephen? Do I? Yeah. Oh, hell yes. I was just I got to shovel uh, an enormous amount of manure. And I'm happy to put 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 that off for another few minutes. No problem. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, Alan, uh, you had a question if you can ask it. So, uh, you know, many teachers uh, say that take the attitude of uh, live today as if it's your last. And I'm just curious, Stephen, what your take on on that, you know, as a phrase and approach is. Oh, OK, that's blessedly a concise question. Um, I'm not persuaded by that there's any wisdom inherently lingering in that observation. And I'll tell you why. If the sheer fact of dying, let's call it the available facticity of death, had the transformative power that that piece of advice suggests, we wouldn't need the piece of advice. Don't forget, there's more of us than there's ever been on this planet. By definition, there's more death, human death, than there's ever been on this planet. And if that were true, then we would be wiser by some insane margin over our predecessors, not just in the matter of dying, but of course, in the matter of living too. And you see, the, the assumption that, that's buried in the observation is that if you knew you were going to die imminently, it would immediately and immaculately transform into clarity of purpose, singularity of intent, willingness to bear the, the sanity of the world in mind, uh, a servant to your, the particulars of your life, you know, on and on and on. And friends, what I'm pleading with you to consider is that in my time in the death trade, I virtually never saw a death induced um, awakening occur. By which I'm saying to you this, people tended to die in the manner of their living. Alas. And if their living was conducted day in and day out in a death phobic culture, and it was, in a grief illiterate culture, and it was, then one of the consequences is likely, very likely to be that at the deathbed, you will see the most stout performance of death phobia and all that anxiety and trauma that I was alluding to earlier. That's where you'd expect to find it. And that's where I found it. So the oncomingness of death in and of itself does nothing to bring people anything <clears throat> that they haven't already entertained. Death is a deity, but not an overwhelming one. 
In other words, our attachment to our take on things is so robust that it can actually tolerate the oncomingness of death with no appreciable diminishment. Finally, I was routinely asked in more in the old days than now, whether or not I found that people who, who the dying people who had a, a philosophical or religious orientation, a kind of demonstrable, practicable orientation, somehow had better outcomes. That was tended to be the question. And I said, better outcomes. <laughs> and they said, well, yeah. I said, you mean like didn't die after all? Or how, how do you mean by better outcome? No, no, they just had a better time of it. What's the assumption in the question? That some kind of organized religiosity or disorganized religiosity in the form of philosophy, let's say, had the consequence of visiting upon a person an uncommon degree of certainty and clarity and capacity to, to discern and all the rest that was not available to them in their time of, you know, peak income generating years and all the rest. <laughs> if that's true, we should be looking forward to it. But it's not true and almost nobody does. So you die in the manner of your living, typically. And this is a sad burden to bear uh, when your death learning comes to you via the courtesy of a death phobic culture, who's offering you ongoingly, as I speak, alternatives to having to die. And um, I've yet to see an upside. I mean, I've been in the trade long and around it long enough to to be willing to be wrong about all these things that I've said to you. I've even tried to be wrong about them. And alas, the, the last 20 months of an encounter with a biblically um, scaled plague from everything I've heard and seen has done virtually nothing to call into question <coughs> the prevailing weather when it comes to mortality. And I wonder what it would take if a plague is not going to do it. I wonder what it would take. And I'm not sure that there's anything that can bring us any closer to the cliff edge without pushing us over to give us a chance, quote unquote, voluntarily to get a few things straight. So I, I know I'm leaving th this session on a bit of a, with a sense of lament, but I think that's the most accurate um, portrayal of my own uh, encounter with this matter over the last while. And uh, so in that sense, faithful and, uh, and a legitimate witness to the times I find myself in. Any uh, final share, Alan? Uh, no, no, thank you. I don't want to spoil that. Thank you. Very cool. So we'll close out uh, here. Um, I'll, I'll just hand it over to Stephen if he'd like to leave us with uh, anything, uh, maybe uh, set us up for, for next week. Surely, I, I can do a couple of things. What is it you're going to play on the way out? I've forgotten what we talked about. Uh, let's just see. You recommended um, Harvard uh, Square. Oh, yes, Harvard Square. Okay, very good. Well, I'll finish with that. Um, you know, I, I see no merit in summarizing what one has just lived through. Otherwise, we could just go for the Coles Notes version or the Reader's Digest version of, of everything and imagine we've got the, the pith. Um, you know, I, I deeply appreciate the opportunity to do this. I, I'm, it's probably borders on the relentless, my, my pacing on the matter and uh, um, ruthless to some degree too. Uh, and whenever I've tried to exercise brevity in these matters, in my responses, typically I've entered into the realm of severity instead. So I don't seem to be capable of brevity given, given the mandate that seems to have come to me as a result of the exposure to the human frailties and foibles at the deathbed. And I've tried to give you a little feel for, for that without you having to be there yourself, because I could not recommend in good conscience for anyone to enter any version of the death trade 
uh, as uh, as something that would somehow deepen your anything. It's a calamitous uh, enterprise. Um, so there's that. Uh, what are we doing next week, subject-wise? Uh, we're just continuing the conversation um, like we did today, uh, riffing off of what occurred here. Ah, okay. Uh, you have no obligation to treat me as the death guy, I should say to everybody who's still there. <clears throat> um, like you, I have other channels I can broadcast on. Uh, so, so there's other things available to us. And if you end up with the book of the generation's worth between now and then, you'll see that the second chapter uh, devotes itself to questions of matrimony. That'd be interesting. So why don't we just say now that we're going to use the second chapter, which is called Matrimony, the Bone House of Love, as the foundation for what we might get up to. That's my proposal. Thirdly and finally then, uh, this Harvard Square that you're about to listen to, it's uh, it's from the last record that Gregory and I did called uh, Rough Gods, which turns out to be at least a prescient title, if nothing else. And uh, in there, in this story, it's a very simply told, unornamented tale of me walking through Harvard Yard uh, when the time when I was in divinity school there and a certain encounter with everything that we've talked about here today manifest in one 10 or 15 second encounter. And the, the beauty of it for me is how ordinary the encounter was and how luminous it became. And uh, those two things that seem to me actually belong together. And that's the luminosity of life never seems to eclipse its, eclipse its ordinariness. And for that, I'm immensely grateful. Just as I'm grateful for this talk with you folks today, and grateful for what you're about to listen to, that it came to me, and that with the Gregory Hoskins' help, I was able to translate it musically and lyrically into something, well, that sounds like this. I went to Harvard Divinity School in the late 1970s. I thought I'd get into the clergy business. The clergy, they thought otherwise. They were right. Things have worked out on all sides of that ill-conceived notion, though. Still, God's mysteries are as mysterious when they work out as when they don't. So I was counseled out of the divinity part of things. I had no plan B at all. I was eight weeks into my career, and I was missing the soul of it all. my divinity plans in shards. I was walking across Harvard Yard in a skiff of December snow. It was dusk and everything was violet shadow and murmuring. The pigeons are a fact of life there. They'll let you get pretty close and then they'll explode in feathers and bawling to land 10 feet away to start the whole thing again. And that happened every bird but one aloft that one who remained in the snow the bird tried again to rise and didn't nothing but flapping bird adrenaline the bird let me get too close I thought so I knelt beside and I reached over and I folded the wings to the body so as not to hurt and I made to turn the bird over to look for something wrong. In that rotating motion, the bird died. A thrum moved through my palms and then up both of my arms and across the shoulders and to my chest and quivered there and stayed there. 
and my breathing was burdened. For some other life had taken its place there alongside mine. And it lasted for maybe an hour or until now. week same time uh, you can purchase the book um, here and we'll be talking about chapter two uh, so uh, do purchase the book and we will be here same time same day all right uh, generations worth there we go uh, all right everyone uh, thanks so much for coming to the store today bye